I'm Anthony Davies, Associate Professor of Economics at Duquesne University and co-host of the podcast Words and Numbers. I'm here at LibertyCon in Miami, Florida, answering the most Googled questions about economics. How does economics affect everyone? I would phrase the question the other way around. How does everyone affect economics? Because economics, well, of course, is the study of economic behavior, the study of economies, these sorts of things. But economic behavior, the economy, this is the sum total of our human interactions. It's me deciding that I'm going to put a gallon of gas in my car instead of going to the movies. It's you deciding that you're going to go get a technical degree and work after two years of education rather than spending four years of education racking up lots of debt. It's all of these decisions that we individually make that are all a combination of our preferences and our constraints. Put all of that behavior together and you get the economy. You get economics. It's, the, it's what happens when we all get together and do our thing. Is economics hard? Yeah, there are two answers to that. Um, yes and no. <laughs> the, the yes answer is to do economics at, in, a, in a technical sense requires a tremendous amount of training in economic theory and econometrics, statistics, these sorts of things. And it requires thinking about the world in a different way. Economists are always thinking about trade-offs. So if you decide to do something, I'm going to go to the beach for the weekend, when an economist hears that, what the economist hears is actually two statements. One, you chose to go to the beach for the weekend, and two, you chose not to do all sorts of other things that you might have done instead. This comes into play whenever a student comes into my office and says something like, I would have studied harder for the test, except, and then they list a whole bunch of stuff. And the student typically lists all of these things thinking that they justify the students not studying as hard for the test, when what an economist hears is a litany of items that the student thinks is more important than studying for the test, because the economist thinks in terms of trade-offs. So in that sense, in, in the sense of learning the theory and the statistics behind it, in terms of starting to think in terms of, of trade-offs, yes, it's difficult to think like an economist. The part in which it's easy is that it's something we deal with all the time. The problem is we deal with it at an intuitive level. So when you choose to date this person, you've kind of also chosen not to date that person. And you might not think of it explicitly like that, but at a gut level, you understand that there's that trade-off. It's that concept of trade-offs that is so important. It's integral to economics. And so in that sense, we do it every day without thinking about it. What makes the hard part of economics hard is thinking explicitly about it. Do economists make good money? <laughs> Depends on what you're talking about. Uh, academic economists versus industry economists. Of course, any, pretty much anybody in industry makes more than professors do of the same field. Having said that, um, let's talk about undergraduates only, people who have undergraduate degrees in economics, so four years only, not master's, not PhD. They tend to rank in terms of salary amongst the STEM majors, actually probably in the top third of STEM majors. So think about uh, the typical salary you would earn with an undergraduate degree in economics being on par with what you might earn with a degree in, let's say, um, statistics or finance, something like this. Now, the key is, if you're talking about an undergraduate degree in economics, often the job that you'll get won't have the title economist. And this causes no end of problems in academia when we're dealing with people who advise students. Often I'll hear advi professional advisors say to me something like, well, um, I don't know what to do with this student who's studying economics because I can't find any jobs for economists out there. To which I have to say, stop. You're looking for jobs with the title economist. Typically, the title economist goes to someone who has a master's or a PhD in economics or a related field. As an undergraduate with a degree in economics, typically the job you'll find has the word analyst in it. And if you start looking for the word analyst, you'll find all sorts of things, business analyst, consumer analyst, financial analyst. 
And these are the sorts of jobs that require someone to know how to think like an economist without necessarily being able to do the higher level theory and statistics that goes with it. How do economists use graphs? This is a sticking point with me <clears throat> because it seems to be the case that the way we use graphs, at least in the classroom, is to describe economic phenomena to the students. And there's a problem with that. And the problem is, if a student isn't going to go beyond the principal's level, the graphs aren't helpful. So when I teach, and I try to avoid it, but when I do teach using graphs at a principal's level, I have to spend a lot of time teaching students how to read graphs and how to interpret, and when the graph moves, how you should think about that. And so you could tell immediately that the student is dealing with an unfamiliar form of communication. So at the principal's level, I find it more useful not to use graphs at all, but to use stories, to use anecdotes, to give students a gut level feel for economics. And then we've got the other sorts of students, the students who will go far beyond the principal's level. And when you get far beyond the principal's level, again, we don't use graphs that much. We start to use mathematics because the graphs are a poor substitute for mathematics. You can do things in multi-dimensions with a mathematical equation that in a graph you can only do in two dimensions. And so when we actually do economics as economists, we tend not to use graphs, we tend to use equations. And so graphs occupy this very strange space of they're kind of meant as a crutch for students who are going from a principal's level up to more advanced level, and yet at the same time, they, they tend not to be very useful in terms of communication, at least not to students at large. Does economics count as social studies? I don't know. Um, let me say it differently. Economics is a social science. That is, the object of our study is humans and human behavior. Social studies, so too, is a study of humans and human behavior, although it focuses on different things. Psychology is a study of humans and human behavior. Marketing, interestingly, is a study of humans and human behavior. And so all of these things fall under this general topic of social science. And people will take issue with the term science and they'll say things like, well, economics isn't really a science. The fact is a science is any field of study in which you observe something, you propose a hypothesis, you collect some data and you test this hypothesis. And you say, yes, my hypothesis holds or it doesn't. And you go on and you put these hypotheses together into a theory that attempts to predict how the thing you're studying will react to various stimuli. That's exactly what economics does. Now, it becomes messy because with economics, we can't run controlled experiments. Well, we can from time to time, but generally speaking, we can't run, run controlled experiments. And because of that, economics starts to look less like a cut and dried science, like chemistry or biology or physics. But really, the difference between the two is a matter of random noise. There is random noise in physics experiments, in chemistry experiments, in biological co experiments. There's also random noise in economic experiments. The difference is the random noise is much larger. And so we've developed an entire field of study, we call it econometrics, to deal with tamping down that noise so that we can get at the actual human behavior underlying the data. What is the fundamental problem of economics. I think the fundamental problem of economics boils down to the following. How do people with unlimited desires behave when those desires collide with their limited abilities? And I think if you go back through history from current days all the way back to when Homo sapiens first emerged, that's kind of it. It's humans constantly dealing with the fact that we want more and more stuff and we can't have more and more stuff. And so we have to make hard decisions, not only decisions like right now, if I want this and that, and I can't have both, I've got to choose one, but also decisions over time. You know, I'd like a nice sports car, but to get the sports car, I have to give up going to college because I can't pay for it. And if I give up going to college, that means I have less income in the future. And now the whole problem of trade-offs becomes very complicated. Uh, in essence, that's what economics is about. We try and 
answer the question, how do people behave under those circumstances? Economics is the study of how a society takes its limited resources, its time, its talent, its treasure, and applies these to producing goods and services that make as many people happy as possible. Why does the economy fluctuate? When we talk about the economy fluctuating, what we typically mean is the broad changes in real GDP and productivity. The productivity is up and therefore unemployment is down and then productivity turns around, it goes down. We call that a recession, unemployment goes up. And it's as if the economy is this living, breathing organism that breathes in and breathes out. And you have expansion, you have recession, you have expansion, you have recession. And in a lot of ways, that analogy is more than just an analogy because what is an economy? It's the sum total of all of the human beings coming together and interacting in various ways. So it really is an organism. And as with any organism, a shock to it will have ramifications. For example, we have a, um, an early frost that kills much of our crop. And so we now have less food and that causes ramifications. Immediately there's less food, price of food goes up. And because the price of food goes up, people react and they buy less food, they buy more of something else instead. And that has ramifications on, for example, how many children they decide to have. Well, price of food is so high, I, we wanted to have more kids, but we can't afford it. And that in turn, a generation down the road has an impact on how much labor there is and how much we can produce. And so you see that shocks to the economic system can be more than just a weather shock. It could be things like one of us discovers some new product or some new way of producing things that enables us to produce more and better than we did before. And that has ramifications because now we're gonna produce this new thing. Someone has invented the iPhone and now all of a sudden we can produce the iPhone, we can make it available to all sorts of people. And what do the people do? They shift their consumption. They're gonna buy less of these things they used to buy and save their money to buy this new cool thing, this iPhone that didn't exist before. And that has ramifications down the road because these companies they used to buy from, these companies aren't selling as much, which means they're gonna employ fewer people and they're gonna to start to wane. While what waxes are these companies that produce the iPhones and produce the, the products that go into the iPhones, Every time you have a shock to the economy like this, be it weather, be it technology, be it wars, be it plagues, it creates ripples like on a pond. And this is what gives us this up and the down, the expansions and the recessions. It's the sum total of all of these ripples that are going on in the economy on an ongoing basis. Why do economists like competitive markets? Economists like competition in general. It's not just in the form of markets. We also, when we talk about public choice, that is economics applied to people's behavior in government in the political sphere, we like competition there as well. Although we call it something else, we call it federalism. That is governing at a state level more so than governing at a federal level. And federalism means what? It means that all of a sudden you have 50 states competing amongst each other in the same way that a bunch of manufacturers would compete against each other. What's the good of the competition? The good of the competition is if the customer, be it someone who buys a product or be it a taxpayer who's choosing where to live, if the customer has the ability to walk away, that customer can deny resources to someone, be it a state or be it a producer, who's producing or offering things that the customer doesn't want. And so all of a sudden now, this, this person, this state government or this producer of some product has a tremendous incentive to figure out what they did wrong and to do it differently so they can attract those customers back. And what happens if they fail? If they fail, they go away, they get replaced by somebody else. Maybe a new political party comes into power or a new entrepreneur comes along and comes up with a better idea that will hopefully attract the customer. And so this, this framework of competition, no matter where you find it, so long as the consumer has the ability to walk away, creates this dynamic process of trial and error 
by which we try all sorts of different things in an attempt to attract the customers or to attract the voter, and things that work rise to the top and they get repeated, and things that don't drop to the bottom and get eliminated. Is the economy going to get better? Yes, <laughs> but that's not the important question. The important question is, how long is it going to take for it to get better? <laughs> um, and that I don't know. I, 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 my knee-jerk reaction is that we're facing, of course, we're facing the possibility of recession right now. We're in October of 2022. We've got some hard things coming ahead in the next 10 years that are going to start with the Social Security Trust Fund becoming insolvent. Now, I say becoming insolvent, what will happen is Congress will alter the rules of Social Security so that Social Security continues. But the problem is, the alteration of those rules are going to mean a couple of things. It could mean that taxpayers have to pay 20% more payroll taxes than they're paying now. It could mean that retirees have to take a 20% cut on their retirement benefits versus what they're getting now. It could be a combination of those things. It could be a removal of the cap on Social Security taxes. Currently, you only pay Social Security taxes on the first, whatever it is, $140,000 you earn. You remove that, and people are kind of excited about that because, well, that's rich people, right? There's problems there because who that's likely to hit the most are budding entrepreneurs. Someone who has a job, but also has a little something on the side in the gig economy. And that something on the side is large enough to bump the person above that social security cap, but not large enough to actually be employing other people. Now, what happens? If we remove that social security cap, that person just suffers, in effect, an extra 12% tax on that money he earns above the 140 cap. And that means what? That means we're gonna have fewer entrepreneurs, fewer of these side businesses blossoming into real businesses employing people. So is the economy going to get better? Yes, it is. How long is it going to take? I don't know.